Hi, I'm Ken Spector from LivingEcho.com, and we're here today with Sarah Jansen, who's a staff scientist with NRDC's Health and Environment Program. Hey, Sarah. Hi, how are you? I'm just fine. Thank you. Could you tell me a little bit about NRDC and your background with NRDC? Sure. NRDC is the Natural Resources Defense Council. We are a nonprofit, non-governmental, environmental advocacy organization. I'm in our San Francisco office, but we have offices all across the U.S. and now in Beijing. And my work at NRDC focuses on environmental health and impacts of chemical exposures on human health. Specifically, I'm focused on chemicals found in consumer products that mimic hormones, things like the female sex hormones, estrogen, male sex hormones, like testosterone and thyroid hormone, which is very important for growth and development of the brain and nervous system. My background is I was trained as a physician and a scientist in reproductive biology. I did my residency training at the University of California, San Francisco, and then uh, came to NRDC to work as a scientist to provide scientific expertise on uh, many of these issues that we work on. There's this chemical that I've been reading about quite a bit recently called bisphenol A or BPA. Why should we be concerned with this chemical? Uh, BPA was a chemical that was intentionally developed way back in the 1930s to mimic the female sex hormone estrogen. It was actually going to be used as a pharmaceutical to promote healthy pregnancies. Around the same time, another pharmaceutical was developed called DES, which was given to women in the 1940s through the 1970s to promote healthy pregnancies. This actually turned out to be a tragic mistake, DES caused a number of different types of cancers and abnormalities in the daughters and sons of women who took this drug while they were pregnant. BPA was never used for that purpose, but instead became very commonly used in our everyday products, polycarbonate plastics and epoxy resins, which are used to line food and beverage containers. So instead of taking it intentionally as a drug, we're all being unintentionally exposed through use of these products. When was it that BPA started to appear in products, and why is it in products in the first place? It started to be used in the 1950s, but use has increased quite dramatically over the last several decades. When you link together BPA molecules, you can create a plastic called polycarbonate plastic, which is a hard, clear, shatterproof plastic. It was most commonly used in things like baby bottles, sippy cups, and reusable water bottles that were popular with backpackers and hikers, like the Nalgene bottles. It's also shown to be a very good adhesive, so it's been very good for using in things like food packaging applications. In the food cans, it protects the food inside the can from having a metallic taste migrating into the food. It also has helped to protect the can from corrosion, especially when acidic foods like tomatoes are placed inside the can. Um, but unfortunately, the BPA doesn't stay in that in either application. It doesn't stay in place. It leaches into the food or into the beverages, and then when we consume those products, we're ingesting it into our bodies. There's been some biomonitoring done by the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, which has found that over 90% of the U.S. population carries residues of this chemical in their bodies. We also know that it's relatively quickly broken down and excreted from our bodies, But the fact that we can measure it so consistently and so frequently in people means that we're taking it in as fast as we can uh, process it and excrete it out. And it means that we're constantly being exposed. How long have scientists believed that this BPA chemical, this bisphenol A, could potentially pose a threat to human health? As I said, we've known since the mid-1900s that BPA would act as an estrogen-like chemical. That's how it was intentionally developed. But as our knowledge of science, reproductive biology, and the impacts of low doses of hormones on the development of especially fetal and um, young children's reproductive tissues has grown, so has our concern about the use of BPA in all these everyday consumer products. In the mid-1990s, there began to be published some research showing that low doses of exposure to BPA in the womb This was done in laboratory rodents. Those exposures were associated with reproductive harm, especially in the baby boys who were exposed to these chemicals. And since that time, there's been just an explosion of research on the low-dose effects of BPA to the tune of 
well over 200 studies at low doses. These are defined as levels of exposure that you or I might be exposed to on a daily basis. And what those studies have shown is that BPA not only affects the development of the reproductive tract of baby boys, but it's also been shown to be harmful to the development of the reproductive tract of girls, especially female rodent studies, as well as um, causing a predisposition to the development of cancer in the mammary tissue, which is the equivalent of breast in humans and the prostate gland. And then more recently, there's been some data showing that BPA interferes with the development of the brain and the nervous system, causing abnormalities in behavior. Now, most of these studies have been done in laboratory animals. We don't have very much data in humans, although there is some emerging data showing an association with uh, increased frequency of miscarriage and metabolic problems, um, especially uh, cardiovascular disease and diabetes. You're stating that all of these animal studies are showing that animals are impacted and there's a possibility that humans are also impacted. It seems like the FDA would want to step in and, uh, and, and ban this chemical. Yeah, that's, I think, an assumption that most people would make, that because we can buy these products quite widely and freely in almost any store in America, that surely somebody must be overseeing this and has determined that they're safe. And in fact, the FDA has um, recently done a draft evaluation of this chemical, and their conclusion was that at levels of exposure that are happening right now in the human population, it is indeed safe. Um, this draft, or I should say preliminary conclusion, was evaluated by an outside panel of experts appointed by FDA, and they resoundingly said that this preliminary conclusion was not valid and that the analysis that the FDA had done was inadequate and was not consistent with the current level of science. The problem is that the FDA, and this is in the previous administration, the FDA's analysis relied on just two studies. And those two studies, out of well over a 1,000 studies which have been published on this chemical, were done and funded by the chemical companies who are vested either in producing or using this chemical. This chemical is made in huge volumes globally every year, which is well over 6 billion pounds per year. And so there's a lot of economic interest in keeping this chemical on the market. And so the FDA was swayed by the industry and their analysis. The problem with the industry studies is, of course, that they didn't find any negative effects, although they didn't evaluate um, many of the outcomes that I previously mentioned, things like changes in behavior and development of the brain. And there were a lot of problems with the way they analyzed some of the other outcomes, like the development of the prostate gland. So those studies um, have been criticized for being flawed, yet the FDA relied on just those two when they reached their conclusion. Similarly, other countries like the European Union have relied on those same studies when they've determined that current levels of exposure to BPA are safe. Now that we have a new FDA administration, they're going to be reopening and reevaluating their analysis of BPA, and that's an ongoing process. They last updated the public in August on their status on that, and we expect the next update to come in November. In the meantime, states and counties and cities don't want to wait because they feel that the science is strong enough and has uh, resoundingly come down on the side of BPA being harmful to human health, especially to the most vulnerable populations, which are infants and young children. And so the city of Chicago, the state of Connecticut, and the state of Minnesota have banned bisphenol A in baby bottles and sippy cups, or Connecticut also in infant formula. And there is also legislation pending at the federal level, which would do similar actions.